Good morning to those of you in Beijing. Good evening to those in the eastern, central, and mountain states. Good afternoon to those in the West Coast and Hawaii. I'm Steve Orleans, president of the National Committee on U.S. Relations, and I am pleased to welcome audiences from 60 venues throughout the country to our sixth annual China Town Hall Local Connections National Reflections. I know as we speak that Hurricane Sandy is pounding the United States Northeast and our home in New York. Our thoughts are with you. Stay warm, stay dry, stay safe. We created China Town Hall in the belief that the U.S.-China relationship is the defining relationship of the 21st century and that getting that relationship right is the key to peace and stability throughout the world. This, this year's China Town Hall falls at a particularly crucial time, eight days before our elections and 10 days before the 18th Party Congress when, President, when Vice President Xi Jinping, who we hosted as part of his trip this past February, will ascend to the presidency of China. The discussion of the U.S.-China relationship during this campaign for president has been disappointing. It's lack depth and nuance, which is one of the many reasons we're holding this China Town Hall this year. We are fortunate to have with us an extraordinary American, Gary Locke, a man of many firsts, the first Chinese American ambassador to China the first Chinese-American Secretary of Commerce, the first Chinese-American governor of the state of Washington. America could not have found someone better prepared to be ambassador to China. The fact that we, he is one of the first Americans who served in the United States cabinet to be amba an ambassador is a symbol of how important President Obama finds the U.S.-China relationship. I want to thank our partners at all of our venues and our small but very dedicated National Committee staff, which has done a magnificent job in coordinating this complex, especially today, global project. Let me also thank our speakers, none of whom are paid. It's a veritable who's who of China experts in America. They've traveled throughout the country to talk with you because they believe, as we do, that educating Americans about China will help fashion policies that are in the best long-term interests of the United States. In addition, let me thank the Starr Foundation for providing funding for this exciting program. Last, but certainly not least, let me thank Ambassador Locke for joining us today. We are accepting questions right now, submitted electronically from all of our venues. We'll get to as many as we can, but let me apologize in advance to those that we cannot get to. Let me now turn the floor over to Ambassador Locke. Thank you so much for being with us today. Well, thanks so much, uh, Steve, for hosting this and to the uh, National Committee, a group that's been so central to U.S.-China relationships going back uh, to the 1960s. Uh, thank you so much for all your great work. Uh, the committee has really contributed so much to U.S.-China relations over the years, and special thanks to all the supporters and funders uh, of this uh, great uh, national committee. First of all, as Steve mentioned, we want to mention uh, Hurricane Sandy on the American East Coast. We're watching the news of the winds, the flooding, and the power outages, and our hearts go out to everyone affected. Uh, we're keeping you in our thoughts and our prayers. Please stay inside. Uh, be safe. I'm really pleased to be here today uh, knowing that uh, we're connected with so many different locations throughout the United States. Uh, I looked at the list of participants and there, as Steve indicated, some truly outstanding China hands. And I'm honored to have a chance to communicate with all of you. When President Obama asked me to represent the United States here in China, I was very humbled and honored. To have the chance to serve as ambassador, uh, representing the land that I was born in and the land I love, America, uh, and to be here in the land of my ancestors, China, is something of great pride to me. 
it's been particularly gratifying to serve at the 40 year mark of modern US China relations with so many challenges and opportunities before us. So I'd like to share a few perspectives with you before we start uh, getting to your questions. As the two largest economies in the world and the two largest populations in the Asia Pacific, the United States and China have a unique role to play in ensuring regional peace and prosperity. We have a shared interest in working together not just for the good of our own people, but really the people of the entire Asia Pacific region and indeed all the people of the world. As our leaders have said, we intend to make history with our relationship uh, with China in the 21st century. We intend to find a way to coexist and cooperate without unhealthy competition, rivalry, or conflict. As President Hu Jintao, Vice President Xi Jinping, and Secretary Clinton have all argued, conflict between a rising power and an established power is not inevitable. We simply must forge a relationship based on mutual respect and mutual benefit. In our economic relationship, we believe this requires fairness uh, in both policy and practice. Fairness means guaranteeing a level playing field for healthy competition between U.S. and Chinese firms, establishing a more open investment climate and ensuring more opportunities for foreign goods, products, and services, ending distorting currency practices, and improving protections of intellectual property that allow innovation to thrive. We also need to demonstrate real results in confronting the international challenges that threaten the prosperity and security of our two countries all around the globe. The world is looking for leadership from the United States and China. And it's my hope that 50 years from now, the history books will say, will talk about the great accomplishments that we together made and not that we failed to act. China and the United States do not always agree. And there are some issues on which we hold very differing views, such as human rights and basic freedoms. The promotion of universal human rights is an essential element of American foreign policy. It reflects who we are as a people and our belief that respecting these rights is in every country's national self-interest. As President Obama and Secretary Clinton have so eloquently stated, reforms that support universal human rights give people a greater stake in the success of their own nation, which in turn makes society more stable, prosperous, and peaceful. It's our conviction that a China that is more open to all views, ideas, and expressions will lead to a stronger and more secure China, which is something that the United States and the world welcome. Let me be clear. We welcome a prosperous China that takes its rightful place on the world stage. And we want to partner more fully with China to promote peace, stability, and development, which benefits our two countries, the Asia Pacific region, and indeed the entire world. The good news is that today, the United States and China are working together more than ever in ways large and small to expand our cooperation and, and to address the global challenges that we face. On the economic front, we're working together to achieve real results for both of our peoples. Forty years ago, it would have been difficult to imagine the interdependence that characterizes our two nations today. To put this in tangible terms, in 1972, when President Nixon first came to China, our yearly two-way trade was less than $100 million. Investment in each other's markets were close to zero, and only a handful of American jobs relied on trade with China. Now, today, more than a billion dollars of goods and services flow between our two countries every single day and over 700,000 American jobs depend on producing made in America goods and services or food grown in America, all of which is then sold to China. An even larger number of Chinese jobs are anchored by trade with the United States. So people in both countries are benefiting from this deepening economic integration. But there are real challenges to doing business with China. And so all of us across the federal agencies are focused on leveling the playing field for American firms doing business here in China. And we're using the full range of tools that are available to us to ensure that China lives up to its commitments to the, under the WTO and with its trade agreements. In the last four years, we've brought more WTO cases against China than the previous administration in eight years. And in each of the cases that have been completed, 
we've either received a very strong favorable ruling from the WTO or settled the case on very favorable terms. In addition, we've successfully used trade negotiations such as the Joint Commission on Commerce and Trade and the annual U.S.-China Strategic Economic Dialogue to achieve improvements in China's intellectual property rights enforcement, to further open China to uh, uh, the automobile insurance market for American companies, and to improve market access generally without technology transfer preconditions. And China has agreed to reduce its tariffs and taxes on imported goods, which will expand Chinese domestic consumption, but also demand for made-in-USA goods and products. We are constantly pressing China to do even more. Turning back to the States, Chinese companies with operations in America are also making important contributions to U.S. output and employment. Chinese direct investment in the United States increased almost eightfold between 2005 and 2011, from $700 million to almost $5.4 billion, and it's on a record pace so far in 2012, uh, with some almost $4 billion completed in just the first six months alone. This trend is a very positive development for both China and the United States, because Chinese companies benefit from gaining access to the world's largest market, to a well-educated labor force, and to the most modern management and corporate governance. Our message to our Chinese friends is very clear. We welcome Chinese investment in the United States the same way that companies from other countries have invested in America, now manufacturing cars, steels, and other product, and employing thousands and thousands of American workers. We recognize that foreign investment, including Chinese investment, is vital to our economic growth, job creation, and productivity. We're also co we're also cooperating by expanding our people-to-people -people exchanges, recognizing that the most important part of any relationship is the last three feet. And travel between our countries fosters improved understanding between our two peoples and facilitates cooperation and collaboration in every field. Student exchanges are particularly powerful in fostering the lasting personal relationships that are so essential to U.S. cooperation with China over the long term. Right now, there are some 160,000 Chinese students studying in America right now. But we only have about 15 to 16,000 American students studying in China right now. And that's the reason for President Obama's 100,000 Strong Initiative, which seeks to have 100,000 American students studying in China over the next several years. We're working hand in hand with key private sector partners to make this objective a reality. And we hope that many American companies and other organizations that are participating tonight or to this afternoon, wherever you are, will support this endeavor with private sector funding. The United States are also working together in many ways that you may not know about. For example, the U.S. Center for Disease Control collaborated with uh, researchers in China to carry out research that resulted in new food fortification requirements, which have actually dramatically cut the rates of spina bifida in America and other birth disorders. The U.S.-China Aviation Cooperation Program has promoted safer aviation programs in China. And under this program, a Boeing and PetroChina joined together uh, to test flight a Chinese airline using biofuels for the very first time in late 2011. And our navies, our navies are cooperating internationally, sharply reducing the rates of piracy off the Horn of Africa keeping some of the world's most important shipping lanes safe. In the past two years, we've had some over 20 U.S. governors visiting China, several of whom have announced plans to open up new state offices in China to encourage more American exports to China, investment, educational, and cultural linkages. All of these joint efforts that I've talked about show that the United States and China can work together in the Asia-Pacific and indeed around the world to support common goals and, uh, and achieve real results. We still have a long ways to go, but I'm hopeful that working together we can escape from the historical patterns and instead forge a legacy of cooperation and partnership that will be a model for future generations. Just as the opportunities we face are global in scope, so are the challenges, from climate change to poverty, from nuclear proliferation to, dis to diseases, no country can solve these problems alone. 
Our countries may have different cultures, languages, and histories, but our peoples have the same shared goals, a better life for themselves, their children, and their children's children. In conclusion, let's just imagine what we can accomplish 50 to 100 years from now if our peoples, our businesses, and our governments are working more closely together. Now we look forward to your questions. Ambassador Locke, thank you so much. That actually, I think, is a fair representation of the nuanced discussion of the U.S.-China relationship that I would have liked to see in the campaign. So my first question, actually, is one which is also given by someone from uh, your home state. Uh, he's, it's um, David in Pullman, Washington, who actually asks about the campaign rhetoric which has been rather harsh about China in the United States. And he says, how do you engage China's leadership when the rhetoric about China assumes center stage and seems to be uh, out of sync with the real U.S.-China relationship? So, and my question was going to be, does this rhetoric affect how you deal with the Chinese leadership? Well, you know, actually we're not, uh, since we're here in China, we're nonpartisan and we don't focus on the campaign. Uh, but we all, as individuals and Americans, have a great interest uh, in what's happening. Uh, but we're focused on the relationship here with China, and we're really on the ground trying to advocate on behalf of American companies, American interests, and American values. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, the U.S.-China relationship, especially on the economic front, is growing. It's robust, but it's also very challenging. Uh, as I indicated, some over 700,000 American jobs depend on U.S. exports to China, and our exports have been growing uh, exponentially. Um, you know, actually, if you look at uh, where we were in the year 2000, exports to China are six times greater today than they were in the year 2000. Imports from China uh, are four times greater today than they were in 2000. Um, and so many jobs depend on, on that trade. In agriculture, uh, China is actually our farming community's number one export destination. It always goes back and forth between Canada and China. But this last year alone, so far, exports of our agricultural goods have grown by almost 30 percent, 27 percent, in fact. And so China right now is our number one agricultural export destination and supports so many hundreds of thousands of farm related jobs. So it's a challenging relationship. We want that uh, the quantity of trade to grow, but we also want more access, a level playing field for American firms, um, protection for intellectual property. So we are focused every single day on, f on uh, these fundamental everyday issues on behalf of American people uh, and American companies. Because when I was Commerce Secretary, we had this model. Uh, the more that we can export American-made goods and services to China, the more American companies produce. And the more they produce, the more workers they need, and that means jobs, which we really need in America. And that's why we focused uh, uh, on these initiatives. Last night, there was an extraordinary performance at the National Theater right off of Tiananmen here in Beijing of the U.S. Army Band and the PLA Band where they, I, at the end, they, they jointly perform Stars and Stripes to a, quite a rousing ovation from a mostly uh, PLA and American audience. It was quite something. And it, I sat there and watched and thought, are there areas, and this was, again, obviously symbolic, but are there areas where we could partner better with the Chinese? When you think about it, if you had your wish, wish list of what we could do better with the Chinese, what would it be? Well, actually, as I indicated in my opening remarks, there is a lot of great cooperation between the United States and China on so many fronts, large and small. For instance, our militaries, as I indicated, are cooperating uh, and trying to fight the, the rates of piracy, the incidents of piracy off the coast of Africa. Uh, we're working very, uh, we work hand in hand uh, with China on trying to stop the conflict in Sudan uh, and between Sudan and South Sudan. Uh, our, our scientists are cooperating uh, extensively on trying to find alternative energy uh, and um, uh, addressing um, also uh, trying to uh, cure some of the most dreaded diseases of the world. Uh, I really think that uh, uh, the key to greater cooperation really lies in more people-to-people -people exchange. As I indicated, we have about 160,000 Chinese students studying in America every single year learning our values, uh, being introduced to American democracy and, and American way of life. But we only have about 
15, 16, 17,000 American students studying in China every single year. We need more people from America to come to China to understand the history, the culture, the language, uh, and the values of China if we are then to have a greater cooperation uh, among our companies, uh, among our scientists, our researchers, our universities, our governments, and obviously our people. This is from Jeff in Madison, Wisconsin. Please evaluate the seriousness of the argument between China and Japan regarding the, the Diao Yidao. Well, uh, there's a, a, a conflict between uh, uh, Japan and China uh, over the islands in the uh, East China Sea, and the United States does not uh, take a side on the ultimate sovereignty uh, of those islands or with any of the other uh, island disputes in the South China Sea between China, Vietnam, and China, uh, for instance, and the Philippines. But what we do uh, want is a peaceful diplomatic resolution of all these issues uh, without uh, the use of force, uh, without coercion or intimidation. Because we as a country and indeed the rest of the world have a deep interest in freedom of navigation and the free flow of commerce. And we want uh, uh, all the, uh, the parties to uh, resort to diplomacy and engagement uh, so that uh, uh, conflict does not arise within the region that, that could affect the entire world and certainly without disruption to uh, commerce that is so vital uh, to the economies and the livelihood of people all around the world. From Ann Arbor, Michigan, uh, LAI, L-A-I. <laughs> what was the biggest surprise for you when you became U.S. ambassador to China? Well, I, I guess one of the biggest surprises was the fact that people knew so much about me and recognized me even when we went on to the Great Wall within the first couple of weeks and some of the vendors uh, all recognized us and <laughs> wanted our pictures taken, uh, pictures taken with us. Uh, uh, there's a picture of, of me buying a, a cup of Starbucks and, and some drinks for the family at the SeaTac International Airport as we were getting ready to, uh, as we were departing uh, America for China that went viral. And I had a backpack on my back, and uh, uh, and and because of that, I, I don't know who took the picture, but it, it went viral, and and as a result, some of the Chinese media were camped out at the airport when we arrived and saw us carrying our luggage and cats and dogs and and uh, and uh, uh, backpacks and uh, with uh, the kids' uh, toys and crayons and and uh, electronic games and things like that. So that made quite a stir, and that was completely uh, unexpected completely unexpected. But the Chinese people have been so great and so welcoming and engaging and, and um, uh, we feel very, very blessed and honored to be here. Someone from New York who is um, braving the storm, uh, Denzi, uh, please share what you learned during your recent visit to the Tibetan Aba Prefecture. What is the U.S. role in resolving the, what he calls, deteriorating human rights situation in Tibet and Xinjiang? Well, uh, I happened to be in Sichuan province uh, in late uh, September uh, in Chengdu, uh, Chongqing, uh, advocating on behalf of U.S. companies uh, for increased trade, meeting with government officials. And I use that opportunity to also go to uh, Aba Prefecture, which is part of Sichuan province, uh, to visit with uh, some of the, uh, the people there, uh, Tibetan people who are involved in the uh, tourism industry, but also to visit some of the uh, Tibetan monasteries and um, uh, to under, really get an appreciation of the Tibetan culture and the way of life uh, in uh, that predominantly Tibetan area. Um, we have very serious concerns about the, the violence, uh, the self-immolations uh, that have occurred uh, over the last uh, several years, very deplorable. Uh, uh, nobody wants that type of, of, uh, of action or people having to resort that type of action. Uh, too many deaths, too many deaths. Um, and uh, we implore the Chinese to really uh, meet with the representatives of the Tibetan people uh, to address uh, and re-examine some of the policies that have led to some of the uh, restrictions and the violence uh, and the self-immolations. And uh, uh, we're very concerned about the human rights condition here in China. Um, but uh, we very much believe that uh, the Chinese government needs to meet with Tibetan leaders uh, to uh, examine the policies that are giving rise to the violence uh, and uh, in Tibetan areas. Uh, we very much believe that uh, there should be a respect for the culture and the religion of the Tibetan people.
as well as the language of the Tibetan people. Lynn in Sarasota, Florida. As Chinese currency valuation changes, what effect has it had on the U.S. economy? And I guess I would add to that if, um, of course, you're representing President Obama, but if Governor Romney is elected and he brands China a currency manipulator on day one of the next administration, what do you think the effect on the U.S.-China relationship would be? Well, I can't speculate on what the Chinese leaders will do and, and what, uh, what will happen then. I can only tell you that uh, uh, the Chinese currency has appreciated by uh, roughly 10 percent when you also factor in inflation, and it's uh, uh, appreciated substantially over the last uh, couple of years. Uh, that, of course, makes uh, Chinese goods more expensive in the United States, but also American uh, products and goods and services cheaper in America. Uh, as I in indicated, uh, uh, our, our trade is growing. Uh, the ex U.S. exports of goods and services and agriculture is some six times higher today than it was in the year 2000. Uh, and certainly since the, uh, China uh, joined the WTO and has had to open up its markets uh, to uh, American products and services. But what we really need to focus on, and, and the big concern of American companies, is the lack of a level playing field. Uh, some of the discriminatory policies that the Chinese government impose against foreign firms and, and including American firms, where certain sec in certain sectors American firms cannot even do business, uh, uh, or uh, the Chinese government has, a very, uh, uh, has subsidies that favor the Chinese companies, or there's a not strong enough enforcement of intellectual property rights, uh, and so forth. So that's what we're really focused on, and I think that's the number one priority of uh, U.S. companies uh, wanting to do business here in China, or already doing business here in China. Another from your home state, but this one from Seattle. The first one was from Pullman. Um, you've been working hard to attract Chinese companies to invest in the United States. They make contributions to U.S. employment, as you just said. But in two recent cases, clean energy, which was I guess, I'm referring to the wind power case, and IT, I assume referring to the Huawei ZTE uh, uh, finding by the House Intelligence Committee, Chinese companies have been blocked from doing so. How can you promote U.S. as an investment destination with these kinds of um, activities in the United States? And this is from Christie mm -hmm. in Seattle. Well, actually, if you look at uh, uh, the investment climate in America for foreign firms, it is still the most open investment uh, destination uh, and the most desired uh, investment destination around the world. Uh, roughly for the last several years, about $100 billion of foreign investment comes into the United States. And you see German companies, uh, you know, from Mercedes-Benz and BMW uh, establishing uh, automobile factories uh, in America. Uh, you have Brazilian juice makers in America, Russian steel mills in America, Korean and Japanese auto uh, uh, assembly plants in America now. So employing tens of thousands of American workers. and. Um, uh, you know, the cases that, that, Steve, that you've talked about are really uh, exceptions to the rule because there's record Chinese investment in the United States. And, for instance, there's a company, uh, a Chinese company, that's uh, opening up a steel manufacturing, a steel pipe manufacturing plant in Texas that's going to employ some 2,000 people. There's a, a Chinese company in Mississippi employing local people to build uh, uh, electric automobiles uh, for export to Europe, actually. Uh, so we welcome the same type of Chinese investment and, and establishment of offices that will employ American workers because we want those jobs for the people of America. Uh, the reality is that uh, in the case of this uh, wind farm, which was blocked on national security uh, grounds, uh, every single year this, this committee, uh, CFIUS, uh, that examines uh, foreign transactions coming into the United States for national security uh, uh, purposes. Only about a hundred out of the thousands and thousands of foreign direct investment cases, only about a hundred are examined by this committee every single year. And only about five percent, only or about five of these transactions are ever modified for national security reasons. Uh, and um, only one uh, that you pointed out, uh, the uh, wind farm case, uh, involving some uh, being close to a military base has been blocked. But that very same company has many other successful investments and operations in America. So our message uh, to the Chinese is that we welcome uh, 
Chinese foreign direct investment in the United States the same way that we welcome Japanese, Korean, Brazilian, Russian, uh, uh, Indian, uh, German operations and factories uh, in America hiring American workers. This is from uh, neighboring to your, your home state, uh, Ray in Portland, Oregon. In the past, it was impossible to understand China's politics without understanding the role of its military. In 2012, what is the role of China's military in determining its domestic and foreign policies? Well, we very much would like uh, the Chinese military uh, and China to be more transparent and open about their military capabilities, their intentions, and their plans. And that's why we're really focusing on more military-to-military -military exchanges. I mean, Steve, you're talking about uh, the, the military bands, uh, the U.S. Army Band and the, the uh, People's Liberation Army Band that uh, had a joint concert last night in, in Beijing. They also uh, had a similar joint com uh, concerts in the United States uh, last spring. But actually, there's more engagement among the military leaders uh, than ever before. Secretary of Defense uh, Leon Panetta was here uh, most recently. Secretary of Defense Gates was here uh, last year. Uh, Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff uh, have been here. A lot of exchanges. We need more of that uh, interchange so that we understand each other, so that uh, we can avoid miscalculations, uh, unintended consequences, unintended conflicts. Um, and uh, we. We need to have more cooperation, as we already have, for instance, off the, the coast of Africa. But we need even more of that cooperation between our militaries for peace and stability within the region and, indeed, around the world. From Waterville, Watermill, uh, Waterville Maine, <laughs> they actually ask a, a similar question, but I, guess, I think the other side of it, which is, what do you think Xi Jinping's stance will be towards the growing American military presence in the Pacific? what some would call our pivot or rebalancing? Well, actually, I think there's been a lot of misunderstanding about the so-called rebalancing or, or, or pivot. Uh, we have always been a Pacific power, and our presence in the Pacific goes back more than 100 years. Uh, and, uh, of course, you know, right in the middle of the Pacific is uh, one of our 50 states, Hawaii. So we've long been here, and our presence here over the last many, many decades has really enabled the region to prosper, to be stable, to be secure. Uh, if anything, uh, uh, it's, President Obama feels that in the, over the last previous eight years, because of our preoccupation with the Middle East and Iraq, uh, some of our attention and focus uh, to the Asia-Pacific region uh, has decreased. And so what we're doing now that the wars are winding down in Iraq uh, and our troops are, have been withdrawn from Iraq, that we're now re-engaging and, uh, uh, and with Asia-Pacific, much at the request of the countries of the Asia-Pacific region. And that engagement also includes China. And it's not military. I mean, yes, we have a few extra. We're going to be rotating some uh, maybe 2,000 troops through Australia for joint military training and exercises. But our engagement with all of the Asia-Pacific region uh, is focused on economic uh, integration and development, uh, technical assistance, helping uh, uh, respond to natural disasters, uh, cultural exchanges. And that, that uh, greater engagement with the Asia-Pacific also includes China, with more visits by top uh, government officials from the Congress all the way to the executive branch uh, to China more Chinese leaders visiting the United States, more people-to-people -people exchanges, more economic cooperation, more trade, uh, and, uh, and, and even cultural uh, exchanges. So it's really uh, uh, recognizing that uh, uh, much of the world's GDP is in the Asia-Pacific region. So it's in our natural economic and cultural uh, and historical interest to stay engaged with the Asia-Pacific region. But when the president says, as we wind down in Iraq and Afghanistan, you know, we rebalance to Asia, as we confront this fiscal cliff, many at home say, shouldn't we just rebalance to home, reduce defense expenditures so that you know, we can confront the, what, what Secretary Panetta says is the greatest threat to national security, which is our economy? Well, obviously, uh, that's why uh, I think uh, this election is focusing uh, on the economy, and that's why we here in uh, Mission China with all of our consulates are doing everything we can to help Americans sell more of their made-in-USA goods and services uh, to China. 
again, the more that American companies export to China. Uh, and, and, and to do that, we need to level the playing field and to open up markets uh, for uh, American companies here uh, with strong protections for intellectual property rights, rule of law, uh, transparency of their legal system, greater predictability of their legal system. Uh, American companies will be able to sell more to China. And the more they sell, the more they produce. And the more they produce, the more workers they need. And that means good paying jobs uh, for the people of America. Because export related jobs actually are, uh, by and large pay more than the typical wage uh, in America. And as I indicated, uh, boy, agriculture has really been growing by leaps and bounds in terms of its exports to China, such that China is America's number one agricultural export destination. Um, and uh, the demand for those high quality uh, uh, farm products and commodities uh, from China is very, very strong. This is from Santa Barbara, California. I'm concerned about fear in the United States of China. I believe, based on my limited knowledge of China, that fear is being perpetuated on both sides, which results in tensions escalating. How do you feel about that? Well, uh, we are obviously a very intense competitor uh, with, uh, with China, uh, but we also have very deep and strong cooperation on many fronts. Uh, it's like, you know, I suppose Apple and Microsoft uh, can be tough competitors but also collaborators. Uh, I'm a lawyer uh, and a tough adversary in court. Uh, with public defenders when I was a prosecutor, but uh, we'd all be friends uh, after work, and, and prosecutors and public defenders were coaches on the same uh, uh, soccer teams for their kids and, and engaged in a lot of uh, community activities together. Um, we have a, a very challenging relationship with China on many fronts. Uh, we cannot uh, minimize those challenges or those difficulties, but we're making progress on those. And we have a whole host of mechanisms from the annual Joint Commission on Commerce and Trade or the uh, str annual Strategic and Economic Dialogue, which looks at the entire relationship between China and the United States, from military uh, to international issues uh, to security issues uh, to economic issues. And... Um, uh, we're making progress in trying to uh, overcome those problems, which is why we resort to the WTO, uh, a rules-based organization, uh, to referee some of these disputes. And we have not been shy about uh, bringing complaints to the WTO, but it's a legal way, it's an rec internationally recognized way by which countries can resolve their trade disputes. So the challenge is that while we, while we have these uh, tough issues between us, we want to make sure that our competition, our rivalry is not unhealthy, does not lead to conflict, and indeed um, that the relationship continues to grow. Because if you compare where we are today, and there have been ups and downs of the U.S.-China relationship over the last 40 years, but you look at where we are today compared to where we were when President Nixon first came to China, we are so interdependent, so intertwined. Uh, and that interdependence uh, will grow. We're cooperating and working together on trying to halt the proliferation of nuclear weapons in Iran. We both have the same strategy. We have slightly different uh, uh, ideas. I mean, we have the same ultimate goal, slightly different strategies. But China, for instance, has uh, reduced its uh, import or consumption of Iranian oil by more than 20 percent uh, so that uh, they've been able to avoid uh, having their banking system subject to sanctions under our U.S. laws. They're working with us very closely on trying to make sure that North Korea uh, does not uh, um, uh, continue to develop uh, weapons, uh, nuclear weapons. And uh, our strategies on trying to, uh, how to achieve some of these may differ, but our ultimate goals are the same. So there is really close cooperation on many fronts. But again, uh, we're also uh, very competitive uh, and uh, uh, we're not at all shy to take our complaints uh, uh, to the WTO or to try to address it uh, with the Chinese directly. Ron at Grinnell, Iowa. What can ordinary American citizens do to contribute to and improve U.S.-China relations? Well, I, I think uh, uh, for Ron in, in Iowa, uh, obviously hosting uh, uh, a low government official, uh, a county government official named Xi Jinping many, many years ago certainly has helped uh, U.S.-China relations. And 
And now Vice President Xi Jinping uh, remembers so fondly his visit to, uh, to Iowa. He's now, in fact, hosting some of the families that, uh, to China, that, uh, the families that hosted him. Uh, he has very, very warm uh, regard for the people of Iowa and all of America. I think those people-to-people -people relations and interactions are the key to stronger economic, political, uh, and scientific cooperation uh, down the road. And so I encourage more people-to-people -people exchanges, which is why we have focused here in, in China on making it easier or faster for the Chinese to get a visa to travel to the United States for business, uh, for pleasure uh, or for study. Uh, still subjecting the Chinese to rigorous scrutiny as we do for all people from around the world to ensure our national security in the aftermath of September 11th. Uh, but try, trying to uh, simplify and uh, uh, make more efficient that process uh, so that uh, uh, more Chinese visitors can come to America. And within this last year, we've issued about one point three 1.4 million visas uh, for Chinese to come to America and um, you know the uh, uh, Chinese tourists Chinese tourism to the United States is up and the average Chinese uh, visitor spends about uh, six thousand five hundred dollars per visit and that's money for in the hotels and the restaurants and the taxi cabs and uh, and the shopping trips which you know feeds uh, and fuels our American economy What's the what's been a remarkable improvement in the wait time for Chinese coming to the United States applying for visas? Well, uh, you know, two years ago in Beijing during the summertime, uh, people had to wait over 100 days to get their mm. interview in order to get a visa to come to the United States. And a year ago in Shanghai in the summertime, it was more than 70 days. For the last 12 months since I've been here as ambassador, uh, the average wait time throughout the entire year has been five days. Right now, it's only two days throughout all of China. If you want an interview, you want a visa, you have to get your interview uh, to comply with national security requirements. But the wait time for that interview is only two days. And during the height of the summertime, uh, when we were at our busiest, the average wait time was no more than eight days throughout all of, uh, all of China. So our people have done an incredible job of trying to be as efficient and as customer focused as possible. And we've done it without adding new facilities or hardly any new staff. What's the tourist dollar now, the Chinese tourist dollar generating in the United States? Do we, know, do we have a number that we use on that? Oh, boy, I don't know the total uh, uh, dollar amount, but I know that uh, all the Chinese tour operators are projecting even more tourism travel uh, to the United States this coming year, uh, whether to Hawaii and, and to the mainland. Uh, but again, the, the average uh, visitor, Chinese visitor to the United States spends over $6,500 per visit, which is more than what the Europeans spend when they visit the United States. And that's money at the department stores, at restaurants, movie theaters, um, uh, taxi cabs and hotels, and all of those, all of that money then, uh, you know, like the, the you know, Money at the department stores means more jobs for the clerks at, uh, at the department stores. And those clerks and those restaurant workers and those taxi cab drivers, they shop in malls, eat in other restaurants, purchase cars, remodel their homes. So that benefits the entire U.S. economy. This is from Ben in Washington, D.C., which is a similar question. Is there more that we should be doing at the national, at the subnational level? There is more that our state should be doing. You, as a former governor, mm -hmm. uh, do you have a, anything to add to governors and mayors around the country? Well, uh, you know, America produces such great products and services that are highly valued and in great demand by the Chinese people, and that would also help the Chinese leaders meet their objectives of raising the standard of life, the quality of life here uh, in China, whether it's cleaning up the environment, providing food, uh, or medical devices to improve the health care delivery of China. So the challenge really is to match those great made in America goods and services or the food we grow on our farms uh, and bring them to China. And that's where the governors and the mayors can really be effective, leading trade delegations and, uh, and, and bringing their companies to China to help them sell those made in USA goods and services. We have about one minute left. Anything that you would like to add to all the venues, you know, with some closing remarks? Well, we really need people to, to be engaged on U.S.-China relations. Uh, again, it's a growing, it's a robust relationship, it's a challenging relationship. Uh, 
Uh, but compared to where we were 40 years ago or 30 years ago when President Carter established diplomatic relations with China, we are so, more, so much more intertwined and interdependent. And it's really my hope that with greater U.S.-China cooperation at our government level, our business levels, our people-to-people -people level among our scientists and researchers, that the history books will say 50 and 100 years from now, it was China and the United States working together that solved so many of the problems, not just of China, not just of the United States, but indeed the entire world, from climate change uh, to diseases uh, to safe drinking water uh, to the pro uh, halting the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction. I hope the, the history books will look kindly uh, on what our people are doing together. I think that is a perfect way to end this this conversation. I want to thank you, Ambassador Locke, for giving so willingly of your time. And I want to thank everyone at all of the venues for being with us this afternoon or tonight. And I wish you safe uh, <laughs> journey in the, in the Northeast and staying safe, dry, and warm. And uh, thank you all for being with us today. Thank you.